the stars of Children of the Corn. Please welcome to the stage John Philbin. Next it's up, like we, John Gilbert and the stars of children. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Courtney Gaines. Malachi! <laughs> and please welcome to the stage, John Franklin. <laughs> so 40 years ago today, what was the premiere night like for you guys? The premiere? Yeah. There was no premiere. We I went to see it on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood to see the movie. It was there was no premiere, right? Yeah. No, it just happened that it was I think it was Hollywood Boulevard, like in a rundown theater. And I was there with some friends and we bumped into Courtney and his friends. So we're like Oh, okay. really cool. There's no red carpet, no... That's how low budget it was back then to make that movie. There was no premiere. Right? I didn't see it. No premiere. I wasn't invited to the show you guys went to. I just got on the tour just like last year. Oh, no. That's true. That's true. There was no impact. Wow. Hey, great leading question. Big time. <laughs> I had just done... I just moved from Chicago. Like, six weeks earlier before I got the part. And I had just been doing a play where I played a possessed kid. And, um, and then I just, when I got the part, which was given you know, right away because they wanted somebody over 18 but looking younger, um, I just started watching like late night preachers. No, there were no boy preachers at that time. You know, I was just watching them and kind of soaking up and adding a little bit of. I, just, I always wanted them to be charming too, especially with the kids, like you know, brushing her face. I just thought that's so creepy. But what was your favorite um, behind the scenes? thing that happened to you guys on set? I'll take that one. It's an easy one. So my first day um, was the first thing you see when I come out of the farm field, you know, uh, when, they, when they hit the kid and then he, when she has the dream sequence, he pops up and, uh, and scares her. Well, they really did that to her. They snuck him under and it scared, she jumped back like 10 feet. It was awesome. It was the best prank I've still seen on a film of this day. It was, uh, it was my first scene, my first day. It's a pretty special moment. There you go. Thank you. What do you, what do you guys have? Most memorable? Back scene. Most back vulnerable, yes. Back I, I, most vulnerable? <laughs> I, it was my first movie, and all I remember was my first scene was carving a pentagram into my chest, and it was taking a while. And it was a, the guy came in and showed me the knife, and it was a tube of blood. The guy had the bucket, and he was pumping it, you know, and I was going to go like this, and the blood was going to come through. And they're like, okay, John, you got like, you know, an hour and a half forward in the shoot. So I was like, I just went to the other room and started doing sit ups and push ups. And that's, you know, the director came and he goes, I've never seen an actor do so many sit ups and push ups in my life. I go, do my shirts off in 10 minutes. <laughs> You're welcome. I guess one of the cultist scenes was when they had to be tied on the cross, and this sort of pivots, so it goes down. And they, Everyone was gone. It was like you know, midnight, 3 a.m., and it was like bare minimum crew, and it was like 20 degrees. It was like you breathe and you see your breath. And they kept lowering me between every take, you know, either to load the film and the camera, or to cover me up. Ah, <laughs> covered me up. And I finally just say, you know, stop it. Just stop covering me up. Just leave me up there. Shoot, shoot, let's get out of here. And the crew just went, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I know John's been in yeah, right, yeah. part six. Right. I was so lucky to be able to you know, co-write Children Corner number six. And, and it was really neat writing Isaac's dialogue. You know, my favorite line is, I don't have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would definitely come back. I don't know how, you know, you, you, I don't want to spoil or learn how it's number six ends. But it was like, you know, so, but anything's possible. It's a magic movie. I was in a coma in the, from the, after the first movie for 17 years. So. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I was, I was maybe supposed to do something in 666 that didn't happen. I was maybe supposed to do a cameo in a uh, sci-fi one, and I had a convention to do, and then there was weather problems, and they didn't make it. So it hasn't happened yet, but um, like they want to bring Malachi back, you know, pay me enough money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for scale. <laughs> Stephen King is my take on that for all these years. Something about that guy's writing and children killing adults is never going to go out of style. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and hit the casting. We saw our first, our first movies. Something about that was really cast well. Yeah, no, I agree. It's the rock and roll, right? The teenage rebellion, right? It's, that's never. <laughs> Uh, so teenagers, there's always going to be teenagers who hate their parents, right? You know, that's the authority. I think that's the, I think that's the key, you know, for, to, for sure. And also what I think is really cool is when it first came out 40 years ago, all the kids that were teenagers who were going, yeah, kill birds, kill birds, are now parents or grandparents going, don't kill me, don't kill me. It's just a generational thing keeps flipping over. I think the thing we couldn't have predicted is that horror would go completely mainstream. When we did that movie, it was considered a B-movie, you know, and now it's, horror is completely mainstream on television and all that. So we just, we just grow more popularity because the genre is grown more popularity. Yeah, for me, it's the uh, scene when she asks, what do you want? And I say, we want to give you peace. That was my favorite moment. That's when I learned as an actor, less is more, you know? A lot of scenes on the screaming and being crazy, but that scene to me was the most chilling. So. My favorite scene was at night, it was freezing cold, the lights were blue, the stuff, fog coming out of our thing. I went, when I had to go to the cornfield, and I just felt like so special. Uh, you know, I was the sacrifice, and, and I just, I really, you know, I was thrilled. That was a great choice. No, seriously, that was a great choice. <laughs> to be, to be the man, the guy. It was so fun. There's two scenes that I love. Um, the first is just, I have no lines, but I just look at the cafe window at him and say, you know, kind of let the massacre begin. And that's pictures on my table. And this, that first time I saw it, like, whoa, what was that creepy kid? <laughs> and then the other scene is, I, I had just landed in, Sioux City, Iowa, I can't remember we shot in Nebraska, Iowa, but I did the huge preaching scene in the corner room, and that was my first scene up, and I, I'm so proud of myself because I was, it was my, our first film, I was nervous, you know, and you got to say your lines, and, 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 and you know, whenever you finish a certain line, you have to be, they call them marks, so for the camera, and I was just like, take after take, I just did it, nailed it, and they were calling me one take for a and it's just like, yay, a little bit of the pressure was off. How long did it take to film? I think it was like six weeks. Yeah, six, 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 six weeks, six, six seven. That's a wow. I know, it was fast, low budget. That's amazing, I mean, to, to do that in six weeks, uh, and, and with it being the first film for so many of you, you know, yeah. you would think that would just, you know, the states and first time things would just create a longer film time period, you know? Yeah. Fritz Kirsch, the director, you know, I don't really ever remember him making it feel like we had to rush or mm -hmm. that, you know, and that, that was great. Because a lot of times on sets they do that and it just puts all this undue pressure on you, you know. Um, I always felt like you just feel like we're going to get this, you know. Yeah. And that, that's a good feeling. Yeah. Did it feel like extra special to see yourself on the big screen for the first time? It was surreal, so it's, because it was the first time I had seen myself, you know, like, four or five feet on the road. And so it was like looking at my brother or something. <laughs> like, why is my brother so good at it? I was terrified. I, mean, I remember my parents were there, my friends were there. And I still find premieres absolutely terrifying. You just have no idea what you're going to see. And, uh, yeah, it's really strange and uncomfortable for me. Yeah. The first one I saw was, you know, Roger Ebert, they critiqued it uh, on TV, and I was like, so nervous, I'll show it was coming out in a minute, and they showed a scene that I was in, in the TV thing before Roger Ebert went, well, you know, not the best actors in the world. <laughs> 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 I 
kidding me? We go, but you know, he goes, but they got something, you know, they got something. I mean, we're still talking about it. That hardly ever happens. But I was horrified, and you know, at first, yeah, we got pretty bad for losing. Yeah, watch that. Who's the one with with Martin Sheen about the president? Ooh, I like Dead that. Zone. I really like Dead that. Zone. Yeah, Dead Zone. Yeah, that's a good one. That one. I like. I'll go with that. That's good. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never seen that in the movie thing. Yeah, it's good. I've heard. Really? <laughs> 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 okay, Dead Zone Part 2. Coming soon. Not the shiny movie? Not the shiny funny one? No. It was on forever. Yeah. Yeah, we've been playing. Jack out again is like over here. But this hotel, when I checked in like Thursday, it was actually Friday morning, like 12.30 a.m., 1 p.m., 1 a.m., and I'm going down the long, 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 long corridor, in a corridor, and there's like one light kind of flickering, and it's still flickering, <laughs> and, like, okay. and nobody around, yeah! <laughs> checking into the Shining. We, we've had the Shining twins here, and, oh, and, and, and yeah. a girl came out of her room one day, when the two twins had just come out of their room. <laughs> and she looked down the hall and saw the two twins and she freaked out. <laughs> um, and this might be a little off topic, but do you have any fun Return of the Living Dead stories? Oh, God, fun. Fun Return of the Living Dead stories. Well, the f I mean, Tarman coming out of the back room and, and, you know, that guy, brilliant actor, but was lying in a tar suit in his own sweat for six hours before they were ready to sh you know, shoot him again. And I just felt, so we, we'd walk by, we'd be shooting all these scenes, you know, eating lunch, we'd come back and there's this guy in this rubber suit, you know, and in this, you know, in a suit of sweat, these rubber, you know. We just, that was insane. And then when he got up to, to move and come out of that thing, when he came out of that door and he walked weird, you know, it was freaky, actually scary. Freaky weird. So the first time I saw Tarman move from behind that door, it was awesome. But I, I mean, the best part for me about that movie was the PAs. If you ever get a chance to be a PA on, on a film, you want to be on a film where it's raining and where the actors get caught in the rain early and it's at night. So your job will be to take a hose to the actors <laughs> before every scene for like four weeks. <laughs> Not heat, just a hose at night. Like stand, stand still, bro. I'm just gonna hose you off. That was pretty. I was like, I'm an actor in the movie. <laughs> it was awesome. No, it was so. It was. It was really a crazy shoot. Yeah, I found children, after Children in the Corner, it was really a shocking experience for me. Uh, it was just weird, you, you know, every, people were recognizing you wherever you go. It never happened before. And then on top of it, it's this stuff, so then like, you got the kids crying to their parents and things. And, and it was just like, whoa, I did not expect this, you know? And um, what I learned from that was the power of cinema and that how cinema does affect us. And then I, I started trying to pick I, you know, some jobs that, that that, uh, that made a difference in saving that camp, Find Me Love. You know, people come up to me after and go, like, I was a senior football guy in high school and I was looking forward to hazing the juniors. And, and then I saw that movie and I couldn't do it. And you're like, whoa, lightweight romantic comedy, but like it actually made a difference, right? That's the kind of stuff I think is really cool about making movies. Okay. Go ahead. I, no, I was just going to say, I'm 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 just um, I was at a, a restaurant called Barney's Beanery in West Hollywood with friends, and we're eating, and then all of a sudden, it was like a couple of women are sitting next to a table across from us, and all of a sudden, she's like, sort of, ah! she says, and that was so scary. And like, they, she made the make TV move into her entire group to a different part of the restaurant. So, like, and then, like, and a week later, I'm, I'm like going on an audition, I get on an elevator in Hollywood, and all of a sudden, this woman sees me, and she's like, jams the door and runs off the elevator. She could not be on the elevator with me. It's like, you hear about this stuff with soap opera actors where they're, you know, the evil person on the soap opera. And they're well, how could you do that to Jessica? How could you cheat my wife? It's like, so it's like, sort of like that. Like, no, I was just acting. 
But it's like, as Courtney said earlier, it was a B-movie. So in some respects, I would go out, like I was up for a De Niro part, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was obviously a kid still. And, and then finally it came down to it, and the producers would say, he was just in Children of the Corn, like, you can't use him. Because it was just like a hierarchy of, you know, quality film. And you know, so it was like, it, it hurt at first. Later on, I did Cousin It in Adam's Valley and stuff like that. But by that time, it was like six or seven years later, and then they thought it was fun. It was also a different genre. It was the you know, De Niro movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I was a failure as an actor, you know, after I had a pretty good run for like 10 years, but I really, I was never like, a lead in a big movie or anything like that. Nobody ever came up, hey, you're in Children of the Corn, never. Until five, ten years ago, maybe, when they showed that the Americans in the tech. And then at around that same time, Return of the Living Dead became a cult movie, you know. And, uh, you know, Point Break kind of became culty, you know. Point Break was huge, man. But not when it came out. Really? Yes. So, I mean, I was, I had quit, I, I thought I was a failure as an actor until these conventions started. and. You know, people started, I started going to conventions and people were like, hey, that was cool, I like that movie you did. You know, and I'm looking at pictures of myself from when I was 20 something, I'm like, that's pretty cool. But at the time, <laughs> I didn't feel that until much, much later. I'm just glad I stayed alive. And it's really just got lucky with those cult, you, this cult, cult movie. You don't start out trying to make a cult movie, you don't know what's going to happen. But we just got lucky with this one, and, you know, and here we are. I, I can tell you from like the promoter standpoint, the the horror films of the '80s have become iconic. You know, for for the you know it's going to sound crazy, but for the purity of the way the films were. You know, I mean, the the biggest lines, the most interest, the most requests I get from fans or f are for stars from films from that time period, you know, and it's, and sadly, you know, you guys were young kids, you know, when you were making, you know, Children of the Corn, but, you know, for the people that were older adults in films from that time period, like, we're losing them. Well, we've been doing this for 21 years, and the list of people that, that I've had at the show for the past 57 shows, you know, from that time period, they're no longer with us. It's just, you know, it's astounding. But, like, that time period was a really, really special era of horror film history I, I, I that, that I think people are going to be writing books about, you know, 40 years from now. I think the reason is is because horror was independent filmmaking, and, and so it was outside the box of the, the studio system, so the more crazy stuff happened than people did, you know? yeah. that they would be like, you can't do that, that's not okay. You know? yeah. yeah, and I mean, so many people that became iconic directors, their first films, a lot of times, were their biggest films. You know, Halloween, John Parker, you know, Night of the Living Dead, George Romero, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So, and, you know, it's, it's for me, it's, it's, it's still interesting to see how much interest there is in that time period of films. And when I go to put a convention together, I'll go through the list of 80s films and like, hey, you know, maybe it's a time for a reunion for, for this film or for that film, you know? So when the 40th came up this year, I was like, oh, this is perfect. You know? <laughs> no brainer. Yeah, yeah. How mind-blowing was it to do Back to the Future? Well, the thing was, I mean, we knew it was a big deal because Spielberg was involved. That's about all, all we really knew, right? And Zemeckis wasn't a well-known director at that point that he is now. He, you know, he, he came from SC and that kind of thing. But I couldn't have predicted that that movie was going to go on to be, or the, the, the Back to the Future trilogy was going to go on to be one of the most successful trilogies in Hollywood history. I, I couldn't have predicted that. So. For me, as you know, been in this game a long time now and, and getting older, I look back and just think that's it just blows my mind that you and I have like a small part in one of the biggest trilogies in Hollywood history. That just I, it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around that I even have any involvement in something that historic, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm just just grateful. That's all I can be.
you know. Did you have any scenes with Eric Stoltz when he was Marty McFly? I did. I did the scene in the, the hallway area of the, you know, the you know, kicking him. I says, kick me. And Eric Stoltz was in that scene. And then, uh, so because, <laughs> you already know the answer. I don't. <laughs> I want to know. So the, 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 the blessing there was, was obviously awful for Eric to, to have gotten, gotten fired. But for me, it was very fortunate because I was maybe supposed to work uh, maybe a week. I'm not thing, I ain't getting paid for like six weeks. Nice. And then, so because of that, that's how your residuals get based on what you made. So my residual income from from uh, Back to the Future is pretty much the best residual income I've had in my career. So it's been nothing but a blessing. Um, was Isaac a false prophet? Was that what it was supposed to be? <laughs> I think that's subjective. I just, <laughs> you know, like, he is whatever you think. He's like, was he possessed? I, you know. Who knows? I, I just played him for what I thought you know, that he wanted power, that he was the, the, the smart guy. This guy was his right hand henchman doing the dirty work. Um, the muscle. <laughs> so, but, and the same note, I want to just add an anecdote about you know, Courtney getting extended. For the first Adams family, it was Barry Sonnenfeld's first big movie. He had been DP uh, for, for the fiction. The, but for a, a director of photography a lot. But they asked me in like October to come in and rehearse a dance, the dance ballroom scene. So I, I went in, it was just one day, and then they could do a drop and pick you up. So they picked me up again in January, and then they could no longer drop me. So I was on payroll for six months. Oh, because oh, just, oh, they couldn't drop me again. So that one day of rehearsal, it's like, Thank you, God, Guardian Angels. I <laughs> redid my kitchen, bought a house. This is like insane. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Um, but yeah, I worked with Tony Todd in a movie I helped produce, Candy Corn, a few years before. I saw that too. I'm a fair woman. And I, and I know, I know May, could May, because she was part of our um, same uh, company, you know, same manager and stuff, and she's great. And, uh, I honestly feel like that movie, there was so much talent that I don't feel was fully utilized. I felt like, then, but for me, getting to see Bruce Dern again was the real reason I did the movie because I was, already, when I did The Burbs, I was already a big Bruce Dern fan. I think he plays uh, the son of a bitch about as good as you can play it, you know? He's great at it. And uh, so the scene where I come out with the trash can and do the whole smash thing that I just sort of, that just kind of came out the way it came out. I don't know why it got so violent like it did. It just sort of happened. Um, you know, he came up to me afterward and he was calling on my character's name. He was like, hey, that was, uh, that was great work, Tom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he kind of took me under his wing, you know, and, and he gave me some really, really wonderful compliments and just really gave me uh, an affirmation that what I was doing with this character was working and have somebody that I consider you know, one of the best who's going to do that. He told me this one bit of information that really took the weight off my shoulders as an actor. I, we'd done some scenes and I was like, ah, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't hundred percent there. He's like, he looks at me and said, you know, I used to say with Geraldine Page, she's the best in the business. If you've never seen a Geraldine Page movie, do. Like watch a movie called Trip the Bounty Fall. Oh, she's, yeah. she's a beast. She's, she's, she's a great. He goes, she's only there 60% of the time. I'm only there about 40% of the time if I'm doing well. And I was just like, oh my God, like I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be there all the time. If Bruce Dern's only good 40% of the time, man, and, and it, cha it changed my life. Because now I'm just grateful if I have one good moment in a scene. You know, as opposed to thinking it all has to be great. But I just have one connection, I'm thankful. That's, that's all that's to Bruce Dern. So it was so great to get to see him again and to thank him and tell him how much, you know, it meant to me that he recognized what I was doing. It, today is like, because I'm kind of like stepping back from acting, I'm actually just wrote a young adult novel and trying to get agents. And, you know, but I, I wrote Till the Corner of Six. And, and I love writing. It's just, I seem like you have more control. And the, the auditions that I do get, some are you know decent, but it's like because it's no longer a film and it's just digital, anybody can make a movie. So you get scripts sent to you, and they're just like poorly written, um, and you just kind of wonder what's. So it's it's just it's a different world as far as acting and filmmaking. So that it just think it's when is film 
and that cost a lot of money. I think they really tightened the script. They tried to concentrate more on getting names in the project and the project, make sure it sells and gets foreign distribution and all that stuff. So, so it's, a, it's a different world. It's a little different. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting observation. There's, there's not as much, um, when you're doing independent movies today, there's not as much reverence on the set, and you go on the set, everybody's talking, and it's because, because you can just film and film and film, you see, you put a little digital chip in there, and so it's just not as precious. Back in the day, back in my day, <laughs> when we shot 35 millimeter film, it cost a lot of money, like you said, so you rehearsed, everybody knew what they were doing, the set got really quiet, everybody was focused, because you had to get it, it, it meant something. And I, I, I gotta say, I miss that. Yeah, it was easy. Dave, if uh, court stalks have popped up around the <laughs> hotel with a storm, we're all left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they, my agent, actually, I just got moved here from Chicago, South Suburbs, and it was like two or three weeks after I signed with an agent because I looked 13, you know, I was over 18. Um, and she submitted me for Malachi. <laughs> And thankfully, uh, what was Linda? Uh, Hamlet? No, Linda, no. Linda Francis. Linda Francis. Linda Francis. Bless her soul. She had the foresight to call me in for Isaac. So I, I went in, and there was like you know a room full of Isaacs, you know, thirty Isaacs waiting there to audition. And then they got a call back like a week later, and then there were like five of us. And then the next time I got called back, it was just me reading with Malachi's, and you never want to jinx it or you know, say, hey, am I getting the work? So you just shut up. Um, and then so they just kept bringing Malachi's in, and then this nut came in, and I would tell you, let him tell you his next story. <laughs> so there was an article that just came out talking about it. I, uh, I uh, pulled a knife on the uh, reader. And the <laughs> it was a fake knife. It was a little toy knife like this, but yeah, that was like, but he didn't know it. I pulled it out and put it under his neck, and he, he couldn't see whether it was real. And I saw that out of the corner of my eye. I saw the producer and the director look like, whoa, he was a much better guy. <laughs> and that reader guy went on to become a very successful casting director. Um, did a lot of comedy, like Western. Uh, Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> guy never cast me in anything, and he told many people, like, you know, to don't ever do that what I did to him, so. Jeff Greenberg. Jeff Greenberg <laughs> is his name. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of how geeked up I was to get that gig. Yeah. But also, it was like we had such chemistry, and he was like, and he just like grabbed me and from the scene, and I was like into it too, because I was from the theater. Like, ah, let's do it. <laughs> and so they were just like, okay, these guys are Yeah, the photo you see when I'm shaking him in the movie, that then this is exactly what we did in the I know, like, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was had been cast in a movie I was going to shoot in like four weeks in Pontiac, Illinois, and I had never done a movie before. My agent said, hey, you can sneak in on this. I know these cast directors, Linda Francis and Francis. Jeff Greenberg, and you can you know, try to get into a, you know, this low-budget horror movie. And it's, it's a good scene. It's a small, early part. You'll only be there for like 10 days, and you can practice working in front of the camera. And I was like, oh yeah, horror movie? Yeah, great. I never thought... You know, I just went and did it like I'd never been in front of a camera before. So that was, yeah, that was my first. So, I mean, I, I did it to get that experience. I never thought it would amount to anything. I thought the next movie I was going to do was going to change the world. It was so serious. And I spent a lot of time when I was in, Illinois, you know, Iowa or whatever. Where, 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 where were we? Iowa. Thank you. <laughs> researching my other role, which was to play like a, a, you know, a handicapped person. And I thought, I didn't think any, you know, this movie was gonna do anything and, then, and no one was ever gonna talk about it. That other movie, no one's talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> this turned out to be the one. <laughs> Who knows? Um, uh, so I auditioned for that, for My Name is Earl, a show that I like a lot, actually, uh, for like four seasons. And it's kind of a story to itself that, 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 you know, if they keep bringing you back, it means they like you and they're trying to find you something. And sometimes actors get real frustrated after a while and go like, what do you want from me? And that, that's it, they're not bringing you back. You know, if they keep bringing you back, they're trying to find you something. And it turned out to be the best role I auditioned for in the four years is that one and the one I got. Um, 
really, you know, you say turn it around quickly, what was cool about that character for me was that it got to be things I've done individually, like playing crazy guys and playing nerds, but I never got to do those together, right? So it's like you take like the Kenneth character, some crazy guy did, and boom, you have it. And that's, that's what was fun about it, so it had that kind of arc. And I could do both those characters, but I never got to do them both together. So that's that's what was, that's what I drew on to be able to pull it off quickly. Yeah, well, I love Matt Holland. That was the best thing for me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the English teacher. Yes. yes. It, after 9 11, I just felt really weird and silly going into audition for a commercial to be a great. You know, the, the world had changed. The way it changed. And, I, and while leaving the legacy of entertainment was nice, you know, it doesn't get it, I think, et cetera, more. Um, I just was burned out. I said, I, I need to step back. So I had been a theater major. I went to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and I, had, I was a theater major, but I had enough credits to become an English teacher. And back then, Los Angeles School District, in like 2001, hired me emergency credentials. Mm -hmm. So they were like, take a two-week course with us in the summer. And put, here's your keys to the classroom. And it's like, what? <laughs> and then I continued you know, teaching during the day and then going to Cal State Northridge during the night for a year and a half to get my teaching credential. But it's so rewarding, and I did it for 14 years, and I, the kids love me, and I love the kids. It's it, the whole lot of bureaucracy that I red tape with the administration that kind of wears you down. But it's like, I have you know, so many Facebook friends, I'd say like, uh, two thirds of my Facebook friends are past students, you know, who are now in their 30s, and they're having kids. It's just so endearing, and, and the kind remarks that did. So it's like, I'm tearing up now. It's like, you know you made a difference. Oh. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. When people realized who you were before and what you did before, um, did people audition for you to be your teacher bestie? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I ended up I, after Los Angeles, this, for three years, I transferred to a smaller school up in northern uh, L.A. County. And it was only the second year of the school. And they had started off with freshman and sophomore, and I came in the junior year. And then the, after the second year, they're going, okay, next year we're going to be teaching seniors, and Shakespeare counts as senior English. Who wants to teach Shakespeare? And everyone's like, well, I'll take it. You know, I, Went to U of I, we had a whole year of Shakespeare, stage combat, you know, uh, foil fencing, diction, and I just ran in like an acting class, and the kids loved it. It was so much fun. We did a comedy and a drama every semester. Their final was performing, you know, a truncated short version because it took like two or three periods. Every time we would like, be rehearsing and like, taught them everything with stage combat, I had like wooden dowels like, for the foil fencing. And I mean, every time a principal had anybody visiting the school, like, let's go see his class, because all the kids were always up and doing stuff. And then eventually, all the acting kids got to be in the class because they wanted it, because they were part of William Shakespeare. So I was like, the cream of the crop acting kids who really you know, wanted the lead roles. And then I had other kids. Um, young adults and oh, seniors um, that were like terrified, and then suddenly they blossomed and became really funny or really serious and dramatic. And, and I had female Hamlets and just whoever was best for it. You know, it was just no color intended, nothing. Everybody was just blind casting who was the best. So it was really, really cool. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please have a great round of applause for John Philbin, Courtney Gaines, and John Franklin, the children of the Corner Union.